I'm so proud of this continuation of a training of organizers to train others to organize. I would never ask any of you just to register to vote. I would ask for you to register to vote and learn how to train others to register to vote. In 2012, all of the country as we know it will either be preserved or destroyed. You think about it, unemployment compensation, Medicare, Social Security, it's all up for grabs. And it drives, let me make this point with you very quick. I want, I'd like a volunteer to explain to the group something that is not political. Anyone, y'all y'all studying history and philosophy, but anyone, who's gonna be first? You give this the answer. Me? Yes. Something that's not political? Yes. Like something that all politics would corroborate on? No, no, I don't want to agree, I'm not talking about agreement. I'm talking about it, either it is political or it is non-political. You're, you're, you have to posit that you can identify something that is not political. Every one of them have to register with the state. Ah, <laughs> oh. uh, who? What's a family? Who's the love? How is it expressed? <laughs> well, uh, the hierarchy <laughs> is, is redefining that, and and but the people are redefining it also. I mean, now we have sex, same-sex marriage. Uh, imagine if you'd have talked about that 20 years ago. Anyone? Outer space. The Russians want to control outer space. We want to control outer space. The, the point I want to make with you very quickly is this. If you can think about it, if you can conceptualize it, it is inherently political. We are social animals. We are political animals. Uh, people, when you look at the history of the Delta, they say, okay, black people cleared the land. Black people fought against the storms. Black people created the wealth that was taken over by other people. And what you have to see, and so when I do that, when I do this in other states, people say, well, why didn't y'all leave? Our, we were anchored by our customs, our mores, our resilience, our tie to this land, because we built it. Uh, how many of you believe that in 1861, there was more money invested in slavery than anything else in America. Excellent group, excellent group. How many of you further believe that the second major investment was cotton? Okay. Now, if you were not involved in slaves or cotton, what in the hell were you going to do with your land? Grow fish on them? On it? That, I, what I want us to understand is that the, though, there's a book called Slave Nation by Alfred Bloom Rosen. I want you to read that book and read it thoroughly and talk about it as a group. And then if you, any of you in the group do not support reparations after reading that book, y'all as a group commit that person to the nearest mental sanatorium. <laughs> yes. Alfred Bloom Rosen. Alfred Bloom Rosen. It, spelled, it sounds just, spelled just like it's B-L-U-M-R-O-S-E-N. He takes you into the Constitutional Convention. He explains that how the deal was made. He, Adams, who never owned a slave, who spent his life organizing against slavery, but when he gets to the Constitutional Convention, he arrives and he states the position. If we don't have slavery, we can't have a Constitution. If we don't have a Constitution, we can't have a country. So let us be very, very clear. Race is inextricably bound to this country. How many of you believe that after the Fugitive Slave Law, which wouldn't have passed if it wasn't for the Three-Fifths Compromise, there was a commissioner in every town. And that commissioner was to decide one question. Was this person a slave or not a slave? If he decided this person was a slave, Paul's a slave, he collects $10. If he decides that Paul's not a slave, he collects $5. Now, Paul, since this charge has been brought to him by responsible white people, he cannot testify in this case. He cannot bring others to testify. There can be no writ of habeas corpus. Okay? Guess who did that? The federal government. 
What I want you to think about is that the beauty of this country lies in its flexibility. Those who talk about original thoughts of the, of the, of the forefathers, they're wasting their time. The forefathers never thought about email. You know, they, you know as smart as they were. My, my point, ladies and gentlemen, is this. This country has been, been evolved by people like you. People who looked at the situation and said, we've got to change this. At one time, senators were elected by the state legislature. Then we passed the 17th Amendment. Now we've got white people, white conservatives, saying, let's go back to that. What we are faced with now is a situation that is much worse than we faced in the 1960s. In the 1960s, we could pass the 64 public accommodations. We could pass the Voting Rights Act by building national pressure. Neither one of those pieces of legislation would be passed today. Do you understand me? So what my the beauty of what you're doing, because as far as I'm concerned, I can't think of a more important way to spend your time. Because Paul is going to lead you into an analysis of this history that cannot be refuted, that is accurate, that is compelling, and that should be directional in how you spend your life. You have two options. You can either get a good college degree, get you a good job, and never really extend yourself as far as empowering and advancing the cause of other people. Their people, organizers, have a special frame of reference. Organizers never organize simply for themselves. Organizers have to have a purpose and a strategy and a timetable. If you come and ask somebody to register to vote and learn how to <coughs> register other people, then the next question is where are we going with that? Don't let the other step create itself. You have to have it in your mind. Now, between now and 2012, we have to put thousands of organizers into every department we can, every community we can. If we left this room right now and went and selected 10 corners, and Paul decided what corners we would go to, we would find leadership in every one of those corners. Leadership is the ability to convince people that they should do what you want, and it's in their benefit to do it, and that you understand it's in their benefit to do it. Now, there's another truism about organizing. Once a person makes something happen, they can never be the same person again. Because once they've made something happen, no one else can persuade them that they can't do that. They have the most firm proof possible. I did it. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter how significant, doesn't matter how many, what, what are the ramifications. And then we get a chance to talk to them. Because after, the day after someone has made something happen, they don't wait for, they, they look around and say, but what do I need to do today? And then we got them. Because the power of people to transform their lives and the lives of everyone that they come in contact with is immense. We, there were less than 200 people in SNCC. And I, I want you to understand, in my opinion, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was the most successful organizing group in America. It compares with the abolitionists, the suffragettes, the founding fathers. Da -da 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 -da. Because what it did, it took a simple proposition that ordinary people can do astounding things. Sunflower County is a good example of that. Ordinary people were faced with terror and the promise of terror, the relationship between political activity uh, and terror was immediate. Make your choice. If we can destroy you, we will do that. If we have to drive you out, we will do it. If we will burn your house, whatever, we will do that. And yet people said, uh, there's, no, there's no non, number one. People came to understand that there were no non-political decisions, that if they wanted to bring about change, they had to bring. Roy Wilkins' position on organizing in Mississippi was, he said, anyone who tries to organize is crazy. We're going to raise money on 
on the terror there. We're going to sell memberships. We're going to uh, propagandize the terror of Mississippi, but we're not going to organize. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee said there are people organizing there. There's E.W. Steptoe. Hartman Turnbull would lay out that. And this wonderful giant called Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, and so what we did was say, okay, what we need to do is rely on the resilience, the tenacity, the church, and the extended family. Imagine what it is to live through slavery, then be faced with the black codes for the next 50 years. Imagine the kind of resilience it took to keep families together, to keep each other together, to keep believing that a greater day is coming. So what we did was give them the power to bring that day about. Uh, the whole Mississippi was organized along rigid lines. Everything that existed in Mississippi was to pr promote self white supremacy. Every police officer you met was white. Every elected official was white. The Sovereignty Commission was designed and paid by taxpayers' money to maintain segregation at all costs. Uh, there is nothing more compelling than to look at the history of Mississippi, then look at the history of Mississippi now. We couldn't hold this meeting 20 years ago, but today, hey, along with that opportunity comes responsibility. I am charging each one of you with the responsibility of learning the power of organizing and the universality of organizing. Y'all have done some organizing. Y'all got in school, and that took organizing, money, preparation, and y'all had the necessary credentials. But I want to drive, I want, it's very important that you understand that kind of preparation has nothing to do with the ability to lead. There is no correlation between the ability to lead and having a formal education. Fannie Lou Hamer electrified the country, challenged a president to his face, and ABC and NBC and CBS carried her speech. And then it was very, very clear Lyndon had to get this challenge thing out of the way. So he then, see, the Freedom Democratic Party beat everybody in Atlantic City except Lyndon. Lyndon then said to delegates all over the country, he called the governor and said, who in the hell is this? And what do we need to do to get to them? There were 27 FBI agents there. Their job was simply to watch the Freedom Democratic Party and watch Robert Kennedy. So that the, when the government decides that it's going to make something happen, it's, Lyndon Johnson, and I just go to his, read his tapes. How many of you have read Lyndon Johnson's tapes? I'm sorry? Michael Beschlott. That, that's, and that, but, but, but they're actual tapes. And, and, and the tape, I, I would encourage you to do that. Go read Lyndon Johnson's tapes. Lyndon says, we cannot have this convention seat an all-white delegation from Mississippi and then go and ask black people to vote for us in November. It's in there. I didn't say it. He said it. So my point is this. If a group of people made up of students, sharecroppers, Barbers, beauticians, and some businessmen, there were some of them there, can bring Lyndon into the fight. Imagine what, what we can do today. Now, it's very important. How many of you have cell phones? How many of you tweet? I'm against tweetism. <laughs> because the problem with tweetism is y'all tweet to the same people about the same subject every day. What I want you to do is make a commitment to me, and I want you to really make it that one day a week, you're not going to tweet, tweet, I mean, you're not going to use your cell phone. You're going to talk to people that you haven't talked to before. You're going to talk to that old lady who you know who you grew up with, who was always helping. You're going to talk to somebody who you went to high school with, and they didn't do as well as you did. You're going to talk to some of them old boyfriends or girlfriends. You see what I'm saying? I, I know it's, it's just terrible, isn't it? Isn't, isn't that man terrible for suggesting this? <coughs> but what I want you to do 
is learn the value of your relating to people. Now I'm going to give you a quick test. There are two trains coming to this room. One's traveling 115 miles an hour, another's traveling 175 miles an hour. When they meet, which one will be closest to this room and why? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which one will be closer to this room? I didn't say that. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> I did say that. Yes, that's what I said. Did they start at the same time? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like going, I don't know. Starts the same distance away. Yeah. Let, 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 me, let me clear this up because I know y'all are smart. So I'm going to be smart with you. I don't want no change in my question. Uh, they, they're traveling on the same train, same velocity, same wheel size, same wind coming from each other. Now you tell me what, the, what my question was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are they coming from different places? Of course they're coming from different places. Okay. And they're both coming to this room at the same time. Okay. So could they possibly meet after one of the trains? You're changing the my question. I don't, you, woman, you're changing my I don't allow nobody to change my question. <laughs> or create another question. You, yes. When they meet, they meet. They're going to come together. And? But I, I don't want no crash business. I won't answer to my question. You're so close and yet so far. Yes. Listen again. Say it again. That's it. Now, why did I do that? I did that because I know that the more you tweet, the less you listen. <laughs> Tweeting is a substitute for listening. My grandfather was one of the smartest men I've ever met. He had 12, he was a Catholic's Catholic. My grandfather soberly told me, son, there are two kinds of people in the world. They're Catholics and they're heathens. <laughs> but my grandfather and I read the newspaper every day. And we talked about everything we read. And we had a guy on radio that we listened to every time he opened his mouth. His name was Ronald Reagan. We didn't like the ideology, but we loved the way he painted the pictures. But my grandfather, if you went to talk to my grandfather, he would say, it's because the, the ministers, I'd watch them every Sunday. They'd get outside and they'd decide what they're going to go in and persuade my grandfather. And I felt so sorry for them because my grandfather was going to convince them of exactly what he wanted. And he was going to convince them that they had convinced him. But my grandfather had this habit. He said, if you said to him, Mr. Jews, I'm going fishing, he'd say, fishing. And after a while, I could not tolerate it anymore. I said, Grandpa, you're smarter than all of these people you talk to. Why do you do that? And he said, it gives me a little bit more time to decide what I'm going to say. And I never, as long as he lived, challenged my grandfather again. But I learned from him. And I learned that if you're going to organize people, you have to listen to them. Because yeah, what people say to you will tell you, them, you a lot about them. What they don't say to you will tell you a lot about them. One of the most memorable mistakes I made as an organizer, I knocked on the door, and I saw people sitting around the room, and I asked, whose baby is that? And just hell broke loose, okay? So I don't ask. I taught people. I've trained. Don't, don't, even if you want to know the answer to that question, don't ask. Because what you're doing is you're creating an exposure of yourself to someone on an issue. You're either trying to get them to register to vote, you're trying to get them to register to vote for a particular candidate, you're trying to get them to support a petition about housing, you're trying to get them to apply for some benefit that they are entitled to. So you don't need to make extraneous approaches, okay? I'm going to give you a, a, an old organizer's clue. If you go into a meeting and it's a public meeting and a speaker is introduced and everyone in the room gets quiet, make sure you get his or her name and address. Because that person may not be part of the hierarchy, 
But that person is respected, trusted, and people rely on what they say. Remember that. There is nothing that you cannot organize people to do, providing, again, it's in their interest, they understand that, and they're prepared to do it. More, more people got involved in the civil rights movement, knowing the risk, because they, were, they did not want their children to live the same life they lived. Uh, there is no one, when we were sent to jail, we organized the people in jail. Going to jail was, a, was a, something every black man and woman, especially men, was told, never go to jail. We turned that into, we, we, we redefined that. We made going to jail a matter of promise and greatness and honor. You mean you haven't been arrested? My God, what's wrong with you? We have, we have the ability today as long as we're dealing with people like us, to do anything we want. The reason I love the odds of the Republicans versus the Democrats is, imagine if you were put in a situation where you've never gambled before in your life, but you, have, you get a chance to play one hand, and it's for everything you've ever believed in. You either win it or lose it. That's precisely where we are today. Everything that has been good about this country, every change that has advanced from the slavery, the Constitution, the Black Codes, Reconstruction. Tell me about the period of redemption. What was redemption? Some people not even believe it was electing old Cosmo. No, girl, don't play with me now. <laughs> there was a period in history called the, the period of redemption. What was that about? Yes. I said the, um, it's a period directly following Reconstruction when all of the uh, when the federal government is no longer involved in the South and the Southern takes back over. They um, all the black officials that had been elected are removed from office. All of these lost cause pins white Southerners take control again, and basically all the, all the progress that had been made is reversed. Excellent, 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 excellent. Yeah. Uh, let me put it this way, ladies and gentlemen. Everything that has made this country great is up for grabs in 2012. We must do more than simply reelect Obama. We must take control of the House and of the Senate. And if any of you are Republicans, I'm going to pray for you. You see, the lines have been clearly drawn. I remember in 1964, we got a, a, a large number of Republicans to vote for the Public Accommodation Act. In 1965, we got the Voting Rights Act passed by a large number. Imagine if you produce either one of those today. Is there any doubt? Now, but you see, the good thing about that is all problems have solutions. All we got to do when we come to thinking about the Republican Party is retire every one of them. We don't have to shoot them. We don't have to be violent. Because, and, and, and I'll tell you one thing. Those of you who have studied nonviolence ought to study it. Because if we don't win, our side don't win in 2012, nonviolence is going to be very, very necessary. Imagine no Pell Grants, no unemployment compensation, no health services, and why have hospitals? Well, hospitals don't make any money. I'm not creating the mantra of the right. They're creating it. They want to change the 14th Amendment so that people who are born here are not citizens. Why? Because they say there's a conspiracy of people flying in, having babies, and flying out, and those babies will one day rise and take over the country. That's, that's, that's the reality. There is nothing... But now, the first rule in this is you have to accept responsibility for saving this country. This country is in peril. The 60s is a joke compared to where we are right now. But the good thing about it, you can do that. 
follow Paul and follow me. And between the two of us, we'll get you into the position where you're comfortable in empowering people. Empowerment is as pleasurable as sex and as attractive and as addictive as crack. But no movement, none, has ever survived without it. The abolitionists didn't. The Catholics didn't. The, Mas the Masons didn't. No movement has been successful unless it has given people a way for them to be empowered in transforming their lives and the life of others. Okay? Any questions? Yes. Very good. Uh, the first is an observation on the number of people who are in prison. You talked about um, educating people. I, I was maybe reminded of Jomo Kenyatta's comment on you know, going to prison with the university because that's where we began to study and organize and make things work. So in that regard, we have so many people who are incarcerated who eventually come out of jail. Sometimes they can vote, sometimes they cannot, depending upon where they live. What can we do to prepare the people that are currently incarcerated who will, want, who will one day be join us in the struggles that we have. The second is uh, regarding uh, agriculture, because it's uh, my area of study. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, kind of the, the mass delusion that we have amongst us is that black people have no contribution to modern agriculture because it's become so caught up in agribusiness and these large corporations. What can we do to prepare young black people for the careers that can exist in agriculture that they don't know about because people have left the land we have to follow a good example. There were two overriding theories about the civil rights movement. One of them was parallel institutionalism. If you find an, an institution that's not working, you create it, like the Freedom Democratic Party. Or, and the, the other comes from Ernst Berenke. There's a book called From Swastika to Jim Crow. About, it's uh, about Ernst Berenke, who was a brilliant teacher at Tougaloo College. Uh, and his theory was that there's some institutions that are designed not to function, like the Democratic Party of the state of Mississippi. It only needed to be organized once every four years. They organized to go to the National Democratic Convention. They lied and said, we love Lyndon, and they come back and support Goldwater. But that's the only thing they had to do as a group. You didn't want to hold meetings because then people would come. Even if it was only white people, they'd come and bring problems. It's better to have power that does not bring, that does not deal with problems. Now, the answer to your question is this. We've got to create a force that is dealing with preparing the nation for the fact that there are jobs in agriculture. The average citizen would not know it. And if we want to win something, we've got to make up our minds, this is worth organizing, this is worth save, saving. On the question of prisoners, I think what we need to do is get as many educated people into the training programs and into the educational programs in prisons as possible. And it, it also, we also have to take a position that says, look, Maryland, a couple of years ago, you couldn't vote after you, if you were ever in prison. Political pressure changed that. I think if you ever get a chance to be on the side of restoring the right to vote to prisoners, please do it. The electorate, it, as it expands, it tilts toward us. We need more people. We don't, we don't need fewer people voting. Uh, there is, isn't it interesting that you mentioned the prisons? It is now becoming too expensive to keep people in prison. So they said, well, we're going to put the nonviolent folks out. And eventually, it's going to take a little time, but we're going to, we're going to put the drug people out. If they weren't distributing as real users, let them out. I hope I've answered your question, but if I haven't, I, your question creates other questions in my mind. Not just this. If you can isolate a problem, it can be solved. It was impossible. It was lot. It was absolutely rational to assume that Mississippi would never be changed. Why? How could it possibly be changed? White supremacy was, there was no state more complete in its 
enforcement of white supremacy. But I'll have to say the most creative civil rights movement in the country was built in Mississippi. No other state conducted freedom elections. No other state had a summer project. No other state can challenge the congressional delegation into Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. What does Section 2 of the 14th Amendment say? You. Again? No. Okay. The lady behind me. <laughs> Paul can't answer questions in my class. Okay, get it, let, let that crutch go. Uh, you tell me, what does Section 2 of the 14th Amendment say? Let me tell you, and I want you to remember it. Section 2 of the 14th Amendment said if you deprive people of the right to vote, your congressional delegation has to be reduced. Now, I want to take you to, to we, and we did that. We said we went through all of the motions. We conducted hearings, and we got, had thousands of people of, te of testimony. Margaret has a tape with everyone who gave one of those depositions, every one of them, okay? And what we were able to do is bring the governor, the lieutenant governor, and state legislators and influential white businessmen into a black church, and sit him down, he get his lawyer, we get ours, and they said, look, why don't we be gentlemen about this? Why don't we hold it in the courthouse? That'll be more business now. I said, our people are not there. We have, the right, we have this federal subpoena. You either answered or answered to the federal government. Here's where we want you. Bring any information you want to defend yourself. And then we put them on trial. Imagine the kind of feeling that, that gives to people who all of their life have been taught that you're powerless and you're going to never have any power. We got 149 congressmen to agree with us that ours was a legitimate fight. Congressional delegation. And then Lyndon Johnson, God bless his little cheeky soul, he said, I want to make a deal with y'all. He said, now I understand y'all going after all of the congressmen, but if y'all will just agree to go after John Bell Williams, I'll help you get the votes. And I brought that before the state executive committee, and they looked at me like I was crazy, and they said, look, our responsibility is to create a precedent that can be used in Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, and Georgia. We should not Go for a, a deal that undercuts that. For, and I, I, I learned one thing, and I hope you will learn it. You dance with the ones who run you. If you're working with people and they arrive at a conclusion, whether you agree with it or not, that's the conclusion. Now, I know that's, that's going to be so hard for y'all. I can just look at y'all and tell how pampered and spoiled y'all are. <laughs> I can just look at you. It just reeks. But, you know, there's hope because... Some of the most fashionable, conformist people in the world have been some of the greatest organizers. Diane Nash was a beauty queen, but she was tough as nails. So, uh, ladies, there is no defense for you not doing what is right. Yes? Good, I'll tell you right now. I was, uh, I got sucked into the Mississippi Delta by degree. The first was I, I run a criminal justice reform organization uh, with a narrative strategy called Friends of Justice. Oh. Organizing in Reno, Louisiana, to be exact. Um, and it was through that that I heard about a, a case in Wynonna, Mississippi, involving a young man named Curtis Flowers who'd been in prison six times on the same charges. And the lawyer who told me about the case and asked me to look into it said, that's where Fannie Lou Hamer got beat up. So I immediately started reading about Fannie Lou Hamer, and that's where I, I heard about you, you show up at the jail. Could you tell us a little bit about what brought you to that point and what happened after that? Sure, be glad to. Ms. Hamer, uh, other people go to a training camp in South Carolina. They come back, they stop in Winona, they go into the trailway bus station, and the highway patrol picks them up. The bus driver had called ahead, and they were arrested. I find out that they are arrested, and I call and said, I would like to know about the 
people involved in the, why not, in the bus situation. So you talking about them niggas? I said, no, I'm talking about, and I give the names. He said, well, you want to find out, but you come on down here. I'm talking to the sheriff. So I go on down there and try to find out their bond, get them out of jail. I'm beaten within the inch of my life. I'm charged with murder. And uh, they beat me so bad that the doctor came in and said, look, I can't be responsible for y'all beat him anymore. That, that's, y'all have to be responsible for this. Every one of our group was beaten be, almost beyond recognition. Uh, and they then got tricky. They said, well, they left my cell door open. They left a knife out in the hall. And a perfect, then they sent people in to interview me and showed me little dinky badges and said, I'm a member of the FBI. Tell me all about it. We had worked with the FBI agents. We knew that it was not. We got out of Winona only because Medgar Evers was killed while we were in Winona. You couldn't have too many black people dying all at once now, even in the state of Mississippi. Then what happens is the Department of Justice builds a airtight case before the judge. They had, they talked to every bus driver coming and going. They talked to every, they talked to the owner of the building who said no, there was no problem. It, it, it was the best methodical case I've ever seen in federal court. But what we had was jury nullification. They, 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 had, they, they said we're going to breed these professional agitators or these good, honest working policemen. We lost that. But I got the transcript, and I'm going to share it with you, Paul. I got the transcript of all of that, all of that trial. Because what I think we, we learned was that as terrible as that was, not one of those people who were in there, myself, uh, LeVon Brown, um, West, uh, Uvesta Simpson, a young, guy, young, young lady, uh, June Johnson, None of these people broke and said, well, this is too much terror. I'm out of the movement. Not one. Now, uh, I just, and, and Fannie Lou Hamer, they mistreated her terribly. But we got out in time to go to Medgar Evers' funeral, which almost ended in a riot. But I, I think, that I, want to, I want to tell, since you're a history student, I want to tell you one excellent case to show you the flexibility of racism when it's necessary. Hartman Turnbull, one of my favorite people, they, they attempted to burn his house. His wife and daughter's in there. And they were shooting in, and he came out shooting. And he killed a white man. This is 1962. And the state of Mississippi said, look, we're not going to have this. We got to change these facts. Number one, that white man that died, he died of a heart attack. Number two, uh, now Mr. you got to understand, Mr. Turnbull had, been, had spent time in Parchman for killing his first wife. But he's the man, when they, the first, going down to register to vote, the sheriff said, look, who's going to put his hand on his gun? So who's going to be the first? Hartman Turnbull said, I come down here to die, I register. I'm the first. That's why I love him. But then, to show you the power of racism, the Department of Justice, and, that, and we live in a, Holmes County has 65% black ownership of land, right? Nobody put up bond for Mr. Turnbull. So the Department of Justice came to me and said, Mr. Guyot, would you, they didn't call me Mr. Guyot, said, would you go to the sheriff of Lafleur County and get him to sign a reciprocity bond that you can take to the sheriff of Holmes County and he'll turn Mr. Turnbull over to you. I said, of course. I'll, I'll be very proud to you. Now, you have to understand, I'd never seen Mr. Turnbull. So when I look at, when I find out what his, that his mantra, he's got to be 6'8". He's got to be, you know, just perfectly formed. I get in, he's about this high. He's about this round. He said, you Mr. Giddy out, you come to get me? I said, yes, I am. Yes, I did, Mr. <laughs> He said, well, let me go talk to the sheriff, and I'll be right with you. I said, oh, Lord, we both, not, neither one of us is going to leave the jail. But he went and said, we have to stay to the sheriff. And then we went on home. But the, what, I, what I'm saying to you is that's what power does. 
Power has the ability to make the impossible, the probable, and the practical. Hartman Turnbow was arrested in, Hart in, in, in Holmes County, along with some young men from SNCC. And the sheriff said, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put these young men out in the bullpen where they can be raped. And I said, all right then. He said, but I tell you what, I'm going to blow the brains out of anybody who messed with them boys. As soon as they, gra soon as they put hit the ground, and ain't nobody going to stop me. The sheriff changed his mind. You understand what I'm saying? You have the ability to take a position, stand with it, and prevail. Now, there are some tapes <coughs> from the 50th anniversary of SNCC. Uh, have you gotten those yet, Paul? No. Okay. I know he's going to get them. When he gets them, I want you to study them. There's a list of books that were sold at the SNCC conference. I want you to read every one of them. Because what there was what that information does, it provides you with the details of organization and commitment and style and a total absorption of we can make anything happen. That's why I call the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee the most effective organization in American history. Uh, there is nothing that you can't do. The greatest enemy to you becoming a group as good an organizer as I am, is you. I'm one of the best, but I've learned from everyone I've ever worked with. I learned from people who could not read and write. There was a man named Freedom Smith in Greenwood who could not read and write his name, but every time we had a demonstration vote, he was right there. And we forced the Department of Justice to take the position that the Voting Rights Act should register illiterates and we won that fight. Katzen back there, Attorney General, testifying before the Judiciary Committee about the voting rights, he said, I'm, I'm sure that all of this is constitutional except for one thing. I'm not sure it's constitutional to register illiterates. And the Congress said, oh, yes, it is. See, the state, you, you couldn't let the state of Mississippi get away with both sides of the issue. The state of Mississippi denied education to black folks. But it can't then say you're not educated so you can't register to vote. There's nothing that you can't change except the fact that I'm a great organizer. You can't change that. But what you can do is you can wade through your doubt, your hesitancy, and become as good, and some of you will become even better. Now, those of you who are uh, selfish and only interested in yourself, and don't really believe the religious stuff that you talk about, then y'all go ahead and make money. But I'm, I'm going to say, I'm, I promise you, as a practical, pragmatic idealist, that everything that you learn about organizing is fungible. Whatever you do, once you learn how to deal with people, because that's what organizing is about, if you go into selling land, go into selling space, go into selling bridges, go into dealing with people, go in, whatever you're going to do, it's going to involve your relationship to people. And you've got to really trust in your ability to identify with people and what makes them think. What's the, everybody on earth wants order, stability, continuity, food, happiness. Right? Any questions? Yes. to a community trying to be, you know, 
of the big leader and explain stuff to people when you don't know what's wrong with the people. Yeah. The problem is. That is more important than everything I've said because that's the key to all of this. You want to organize people to empower themselves, to empower other people, to facilitate their desires. Politic, the, the federal government is an instrumentality for self-expression of every American. The federal government is not the enemy, but it is much better to get people, the sharecroppers fighting and the cotton pickers fighting for the right to vote than we fight for the vote for them. There is no correlation between formal education and the ability to organize and to lead. And we took the position that people will fight harder in their own self-interest than we can ever fight for them. That if we give them a political victory, it doesn't belong to them. They didn't suffer for it. They didn't fight for it. They didn't dream about it. Because what you want is people to understand that when they organize, when they do the necessary research, they can win. They can prevail. Organizing is not about uh, subservience. Organizing is not about acquiescence. Organizing is about planning systematically to take power. And it is much better to create, Ella Baker said it very well, and we all believed it, because she said it. Strong people who are organized don't need strong leaders. Leaders can be killed, but if you have an organizational tradition that everyone plays their party and cannot be stopped. And that's what we have to do between now and 2012. Yes? You said that 2012's problems are much more daunting than they were in that position. Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate on that? I'll one? be glad to. In 1964, we had a problem of dealing, dealing with <coughs> Political, I mean, let me give you the worst case for the political realities in 1964, in the 1960s. <coughs> there was no Republican Party anywhere in the South. The policies of the Democratic Party throughout the South was we support segregation. There was poll tax. There was uh, registration of publishing your name in the newspaper if and when you registered to vote. You declared yourself an enemy of the state. Uh, if you owed white people money, they wanted to pay that way. If you worked for them, you were fired. If you lived on their place, you're out. Your furniture will be waiting for you when you get, when you get home. That was the absolute condition. But we got the country to take responsibility for the, the non-adherence to the 15th Amendment by Mississippi by bringing them into the fight. And once we brought the country in, we brought the federal government. Once we brought the federal government, it was a matter of how long it would take us to win, not whether or not we would win. The 15th Amendment was pretty much ignored until 1965. The Voting Rights Act is the most beautiful piece of legislation ever written, and Mississippi did more to pass than any other state. Hello? I love, I love to take on historians. I went to the centennial for Lincoln at Howard University, and the guy presiding was the most He's a former Republican senator, a judge, former judge. And I raised this question with him. I said, look, if we read Slave Nation and we understand the totality of the centrality of slavery in the Constitutional Convention, and we look at the fact that billions of dollars was invested in slave, that slaves could be used as collateral, you don't need to work a slave. You got 20 slaves, want to borrow $50,000? Want to borrow $100,000? It's worth It's the economic units, number one. Number two, when the, it was the federal government that implemented the fugitive slave law, it was the federal government that was driven and accepted to being driven by the three-fifths compromise, which flowed directly from the Constitution. The Fugitive Slave Act couldn't have been passed but for the Overabundance of representation by the Southerners based on the Three-Fifths Compromise, number one. Therefore, shouldn't reparations be paid? Because it's my contention that slavery was a federal program, not a 
not discussed until 1808, according to the Constitution of the United States. The, the House and the Senate did not have jurisdiction of slavery. That was left to the states. And no one in there, the room was filled with historians. No one challenged me. One, the, the, the presiding group said, well, officers said, well, that argument has been made and the, the, uh, the president of Smith College accepted scholarships rather than money. You see, my, what I want us to think about is when you study history, study history. Because I contend, and I talk to a lot of people like this, and people say, well, you know, my grandfather never owned any slaves. I said, fine, fine. Did your grandfather ever make any money? <laughs> there ain't no slave money, no non-slave money in America, with two exceptions. England contributed heavily to the Revolutionary War. Britain spent what it spent when it came here to fight against the loyalists, uh, the, 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 the revolutionaries. That's it. The basic commodity in America was slaves and cotton. The cotton was sent to England. England clothed the world. We supported two nations on slavehood. And one of those nations, I want you to read the Somerset case. Somerset case was decided in Britain, and it said that slavery is too odorous to ever be found on Britain or any of its colonies. 13 original colonies in this land we call America were British colonies, were they not? Hello? Yeah. So the question for you is, how can you have a ruling like this and still have the Constitution right around that? Slave Nation explains it. Now, you had a question. Yeah, whenever I hear someone talk about reparations, uh -huh. Young lady, you look like a nice lady. So why would you try to change my question? Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't answering. No, but you're trying to change it. See, look, there, there are different solutions to be arrived at. One of them might be, let's spend all of the money on education. Or let's spend it on housing and education. Or let's spend it on health, housing, and education. My concern is that there is a quasi-mystery in the land that is not really a mystery. My concentration is on establishing the fact that there is a debt. I'm going to leave it to others to determine the mechanism. And any, way, any mechanism that come up is fine with me, except the non-denial of the role of the federal government. History is there. We can't, we can't unwrite that. Now, I know that it's, it's socially hard to sell. Some blacks will say, oh, I don't want to be with my... Some blacks said, I don't want anything to do with affirmative action. We got a black sitting on the Supreme Court, who I won't name, who said, I have nothing to do with affirmative action. I think it's terrible. And as soon as I get a chance, I'm going to declare the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional. Unfortunately, we got people like that. Yes. Let me, let, let me tell you something. Let me, let me lift you from the miasma that you're floating in. The federal government is not the enemy. The federal government is what we want it to be when we want it to be, and, this, and history proves that. Slavery was legal, supported universally, except for those funny people that believed in God and believed in the universality of man and the worth of man and, and, and that freedom should apply to everybody, not just non-slaves. And those group of people changed the law, changed the Constitution, and changed the practice. Uh, it wasn't easy, but it was done. Yes. Did you have a question? No. Any, any, anyone disagree with anything I've said? Because I'm, I'm only, huh? I like, I like the way you frame the issue. 
You see, my, and, 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 and I mean that seriously. I don't mean to be argumentative, but because I know I'm right. But there, there are some people who have different ways of looking at this. But see, what I, my, my basic message to you is you have a responsibility to make this a better world than you found it. You have a responsibility to face the realities of you may come, in out, come out of a job with a PhD and not find a job for years. I want you to look at how you spend your time and how, what is important to you in that period, whether you're employed or not. Now, that's a grim way to put it, but it's not an accurate way to put it. Econo employment as we know it is being redefined daily. Now, I would submit to you that if you commit yourself to the empowerment of people, you can do more for this country than if you make a billion dollars. Now, you really don't believe that, do you? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Um, so you said that the government is what we want it to be when we want it. Yes, ma'am. What do we want it to be? What we want it to be is we haven't decided. We, 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 we really don't know. We said, look, uh, uh, millions of us voted in the 2008 elections. Millions of us stayed home on the 2010 elections. The Republican Party, some, everyone who didn't vote assisted them. We haven't decided. We, I find it interesting that, uh, and, and, I, and I, I try to I preach against it every, t every chance I get. The Republican Party as we know it today is not an equivalent ethical alternative to the Democratic Party. And people keep saying, why don't they work together? Well, Paul's a stubborn guy. And if he's made up his mind, I don't think we're going to change his mind. But if he tells us exactly what his position is, and there's no need for me to negotiate, we have to take him in his word. Now, I don't mean to disparage Paul, but I'm just, he was nearby, so I used him. But my point is this, ladies and gentlemen, the issues have been clearly drawn like never before. That's why, I go back to your question. We are in more danger now of losing more by everything that we just have defined as in the public interest in America. We, we didn't face that in 64. Yes. The most important thing you said was the way you closed. If we lose in 2012, we will never be able to recover the relationship of citizenship to the national government or to the national, the nation. Because that is the argument. The Republicans take the position that we want to demonstrate that the government cannot work. It's not in your self-interest. In fact, it's your enemy. If the government just got out of the way we could handle this. Now, if anyone believes that, please leave the room now. Because I can't have, I don't have no time to waste with insane people. But my point, ladies and gentlemen, is his point is very, very well taken. But you see, the reason I, I said to people, I said, look, if on election day, black unemployment is at 57%, I'm voting for Obama. When he was under catching hell from everybody, I still supported him. Because I understand one thing. Thinkers have a hard time in a non-thinking country. 
Ladies and gentlemen, when the Republican Party can declare evolution as a non-entity and thoroughly attack everyone who believes in it, and that's 100% of the scientists, when they can say, look, we are not racist. We just want to cut this bone. This bone. We, we want a God, federal government that is so small that we can smother it in the bathtub. I want you to imagine what this country would be like if the federal government was so weakened that it could not function. You'd have 50 tributaries. And so, some would define the right to work one way. Another would define marriage another way. Some would define who can work. Some would define what is, how broadly do we enhance vagrancy. Do you realize that after the declaration of the absence of slavery, if three people were together and they did not have a labor contract, either with the former slave owner or someone, they could be arrested for vagrancy. Then they were put on the chain gang, another form of slavery. There is nothing. Huey Long, God bless his soul. You know that Huey Long's father was a member of the Socialist Party? But Huey said, Huey was one of the best natural politicians in the, in the, in the country. So he threatened Roosevelt. And uh, who, I wonder who killed Huey. But uh, Huey said, look, when totalitarianism comes to America, it's going to come wrapped in the American flag. And that's what, we're approaching that right now. Now the beauty about all of this is the American people can save us and save this country and save themselves if we just vote Democratic. Yes, ma'am. That's right. And I couldn't help but think about Mitch McConnell when he became the majority leader saying his number one goal was to see that President Obama fail, which is sort of to wish failure on the country. That's right. So would you say that the government, or at least Congress, is evolving into an institution that is not meant to function or that it's been that way all along? What I want you to do intellectually, and, and I appreciate your questions. You, you've asked more questions. And, that shows you're braver than everybody else in the room except me. Uh, what I want you to do is make a distinction. There is no the Congress. There's the Republican wing of the Congress, and there's the Democratic wing of the Congress, and they're worlds apart. See, when we say the Congress, that means everybody. That means that one day they'll sit down and decide we're going to hold hands, sing Kambaya, and work for the country. They will only work for the country when we send people up there who are committed to the country. When when Grover Norquist can get people to sign a statement saying, I will never raise taxes, he, he could have he just got them to sign a statement and said, I will never truly represent the people that sent me here. And yet, it's a reality. It's a political reality. So I have, if I, I, I want to say, because you might not have picked it up, I have absolute total faith in this country, in its president president, and I have absolute, total, unequivocal faith, without caveat, in my, what, the way I present the problem. And that's up to us. So you, you had a question. How do you deal with complacency? Complacency. Well, let's put it this way. What you do is find out something that that complacent person is interested in. See, everybody's interested in something. And you say to them, if you like uh, your grandmother, you can help us protect her. If, and here's how. Register to vote, vote Democratic. Huh? Right, I mean, there was such a big movement in the last presidential election, like, you know, I got my friends and, and we all voted, but there are so many people who are just complacent, have since have been disenchanted. I feel like Obama will succeed in 2012, but I feel like the turnout, the youth turnout, won't be as big. Let me say this to you, my dear. Your responsibility is to make sure 
that you've done everything you can to remove all doubt. The way you remove all doubt is present the facts. Here's what the Republicans stand for. Here's what the Democrats stand for. Now, I'm not interested in how distasteful you find the president now that he doesn't create economic miracles. My interest is, do you want to preserve this country? Do you understand that never in your life will you, John Q. Henry, the man we're talking about, because he's got to be a man, he couldn't be a woman, right? Uh, will never make a non-political decision. But a lot of political decisions will be made about you. There's no way for you to stay out of this mess because this mess is going to rumble on because there's too, much, too many forces contending for Trump. But now, what would be the form? What would be the function? And what, will there be citizen viability after that election? Will there be, because what, what the right wing is pushing for is we want citizens to feel that the federal government is their enemy. You know, when you win the narrative, you're going to win the war unless people understand the narrative clearly. The narrative that, is, that was won on the debt thing is that the debt is more important than the citizens of the United States. Do, would anyone disagree with me on that? And once you make that argument, and when, then you have people responding to that argument, they make bad deals. Now, uh, I want all of y'all to raise your hand and swear that you're going to vote for Obama. I'm, jo I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> but there is a need to look at that as a victory, as something that is accomplishable, and something that we'll, we'll be very, very proud of ourselves when we make it happen. Now, there are going to be a lot of... There are going to be a lot of people who believe that it cannot happen. And I simply say they've, they've listened too much to the Republicans. They've made the mistake of intellectually saying, well, you know, there's the Republican Party, then there's the Democratic Party. When the Re Republicans supported the Public Accommodations Act and supported the passage of the Voting Rights Act, that, was, that could have been a logical, syllogistic move. That's gone. Yes. Let's put it this way. <clears throat> Politics can make anything happen. But when you stymie the political operation, nothing can happen. I, I said it, I, I want to put it this way. Obama ain't perfect, but he's the best available. In 1968, the Civil Rights Movement made a collective decision that we're going to move away from the Civil Rights Movement into politics. And what happened was a lot of organizers stopped organizing. They said, oh, we got these congressmen to take care of. Oh, we got the mayor. We got the city council. The role and responsibility of citizens is to accept the part of the country that is beneficial to people. And it is your responsibility as a citizen to fight those forces that are not committed to citizenship. Now, I hope that you'll tell your mother to read a book called Yes We Can by, uh, what's her name? Cynthia Fleming. Cynthia Fleming. God bless our soul. The book Yes We Can traces the role of the Civil Rights Movement and of the Mississippi Freedom and Democratic Party in the election of Obama. Look at the similarities. Obama says, I'm going to, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Ella Baker said that. Obama goes into a state, wins a caucus, and leaves his campaign apparatus there to build other power, to build, make sure the Congress and the Senate and the local election officials are elected. That's what SNCC did. 
we'd go in, and people, the right people who were writing about us at the time said, SNCC gets mired down in communities. We never got mired down. We wanted to create as much leadership as possible. And we did it. So uh, my telephone number is 332-5157. I'd be very happy to talk to your mother and anybody else. Now, I'm not interested in, I'm in, not that interested in, it, it's 202-332-5157. Now, I'm not interested in your boyfriend and you. I'm interested in you and politics, you and empowerment, you and organizing, and you and the history of this great country. And I mean that sincerely. I, I don't give it out freely, but I, I, I want to believe that I have possibly had some impact on three or four of you. It's hard to carry a majority in a thinking crowd like this. But, uh, and I want you to feel free that, you know, people say, well, what do you get out of this, Giyad? I said, well, what I get out of this is a lot of personal satisfaction that I have kept the faith, I have lived, carried out my religious beliefs, and, carried, and I have show, I've demonstrated to people that I love them enough to fight for them but I also love them enough to fight them when necessary. See, don't tell me that you love Jesus, but you're not prepared to take on the government. Yes? Well, I also I want to point out in response to her, and this was an example from the Civil Rights Movement, that they never hung on one thing. We went from one fight to one fight to one fight. We never put all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. We never made integration the only program. Voter registration was the main program, but there were feeding schools that were organizing The other thing to remember is this. If we are working as a team and we elect Paul president and we stop, <laughs> that'd be a great country then, if, and we stop organizing, we're undercutting Paul. Because Paul, like any good president, is going to need support in the House and in the Senate. He's going to need support in the state legislatures. Some legislatures are saying, well, we know how to get rid of that boy. What we're going to do is apportion our electoral college votes by congressional district. That way you can't carry, if you get the majority of votes, you can't carry electoral college votes of the whole state. They're saying, well, you know, we know that these jungle bunnies are going to be voting in large numbers this time. So we want a personal government identification for all of them. And they're going to call some people by robophone and say, look, the election is not on Tuesday, it's on Friday of next week. Stay home today, everything's fine. Then there's going to be some calls saying, I know you're supporting the president, but don't worry about it, he's won this state. Rest and everything will be all right. You see, the beautiful thing about what the Republicans are doing, it is making very, very clear where the power lies. Thomas Jefferson said, look, we must never allow black people to read. Because if they learn how to read, they will learn what we have done to us and they will rend us. Okay? The Republican Party is saying, 
We just believe in fair elections. And we're going to diminish the electorate as much as possible. The beauty of Wisconsin <coughs> is the governor there acted a total fool and, and gave the reason, rationale for people organizing, and they were organizing around their own self-interest. The best way to protect collective bargaining is to protect it in the political arena. There is no question. The right and the left have arrived at one position. The future of this country will be decided in 212, and it will be decided by the votes cast. Not by the money raised. Because no board of elections anywhere in America has ever counted the amount of money spent on the campaign. You say, well, they spent so much. So we, let's give them one fifteenth of a vote for every dollar. That, then we don't do it that way. All we got to do is believe that we can win. And if we learn history, we will learn that we've done, we've transformed the impossible to the possible on numerous occasions. Yes. We, I hate to interrupt you, but we, it's 4 o'clock. <coughs> we have to take a break for the panel tonight. I'm going to tell a little story and we'll close it out. There was an old man like me who used to stand on the street corners in the town and answer questions. And he thought he was as smart as I am. <laughs> and two young people, just like that young lady over there and this one over here, got together and said, we're going to trick him. We'll put a bird in our hands, and if he says it's alive, we'll crush it. If he says it's dead, we'll open our hands and let it fly away. So they asked the old man, is it alive? But it did, and he said, it's in your hands. <laughs> Thank you all very much.